Okay, so this is part three of the opening form. So in parts one and two, we covered kind of the, the main line and the accelerated. <clears throat> and today we'll find out why the accelerated does not play more often. It's because of this Moxy bind setup where white plays a move C4. Okay, so the idea of this move is that White just wants to establish firm control over d5. Because remember, in Sicilian, one of the most important squares is d5. And oftentimes, if black can play d5, it means that black kind of frees his game. But white, before deciding to develop this knight on c3, he plays this move c4. And it looks a little weird because, okay, he's kind of restricting the scope of this bishop on, on f1. And he's, you know, maybe creating a, a bit of a hole on d4. But it turns out that this setup is very solid. And it's very hard for black to come back. So I'm going to give you guys a whole bunch of possible setups that black can use to try to meet the Maroxy Vine. And then hopefully you can find one that suits your style. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is what I actually use. I don't actually recommend it though for most of you because it requires you to be fairly proficient at endgames. Because oftentimes this system will end up either leading to a slightly worse or a slightly better endgame for black. And so, you know, if you kind of want to stay in the middle game, this system is probably not for you, but it's proven to work well for me in tournaments against people who are around my rating. Uh, so it's called the Gurganidze variation named after a Georgian master. Georgia, the country, not the state. Okay, so the idea is that you play this move knight f6, and then on knight c3, you play this move d6. Okay. So the whole point of this setup is it's a very specific move order. It's a very specific move order, and, and the goal is, I'll show you what the goal is in a second, but um, yeah, you can actually play the Maroxy against a lot of Sicilians, not just the Accelerated Dragon. Uh, and it's very similar in, the, the setup that Black chooses to employ is often similar. But with the Accelerated Dragon move order, this Gurkinidze variation is something that you can play. Um, okay. So first let me show you guys some moves that aren't quite so good. So the main move, of course, is to play bishop e2, but you guys might see some other stuff from time to time. For example, if white plays, say, um, bishop e3 is actually a mistake because of this move knight g4. And here, black is already doing quite well. So there's uh, two points. One is, okay, we want to actually make this move. Knight takes e3. Um, because it gets rid of uh, white's strong bishop. Notice that this bishop is strong because these pawns are on light squares. So this bishop is good. So we're, we're threatening to take this and to get rid of white's strong bishop, but also to ruin his pawn structure. Um, and so, for example, if white plays bishop g5 here, then this move queen b6 is very strong because it's actually kind of like a triple threat. We're threatening to take this knight, we're threatening to take this pawn, but we're also threatening checkmate on f2 if the knight moves. So, for example, if knight b3, queen takes f2, checkmate. So, this actually happens more often than you think in, like, blitz games. Like, you play queen b6, they play knight b3, you play queen f2, mate, they're like, whoops. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, white's actually in a lot of trouble here already. Um, this is actually quite good for, for black. And so the critical variation after this is to take, what happens if take on c6. So there's actually kind of like a forcing line here. Um, you know, taking on c6 is kind of lame because then this bishop kind of gets free. Uh... So the right move here is to take on e3, take on d8, take on d1, 
And now we've exchanged a bunch of pieces through Desperado Tactics. And now there's a couple of things White can try here. So if White tries to take on F7, because right now material is even, so if White tries to gain an extra pawn, he actually loses because we simply ignore the threat to this rook and take on c3. And now to restore material balance, white would have to take on h8. If white takes on c3, we just play bishop g7. Or, or sorry, if white takes c3, we just play king takes knight, sorry. And then we're just up a piece. So he has to take on h8. And now we play bishop g7, and now we just win by force. Because notice this knight is trapped. And notice that this knight is actually immune. Because if white takes this knight, we capture with our bishop, and then we fork the king and the rook, and we win material. So this knight is trapped, so he goes like here, here, and then notice that we have two pieces for the rook right now. And this knight cannot be captured. So this is very good for black, because this pawn is also falling, and this pawn is also falling. So for example, if f3, this knight a4, and then this pawn on b2 is falling. And then this pawn on c4 will fall, etc., etc. Okay, but anyway, that's that. Um, and then the other thing that black can try, or white can try, is take on d1 here, king takes d8. And now, um, a move like c5 or, or e5 to try to put pressure on this pawn. And there's actually uh, an interesting way to play this position, which is, so either c5 or e5, let's say c5, uh, bishop g7 is actually the right move. So it looks weird because white's threatening this pawn, and we actually move our bishop away. But the point is, after take, we take on c3, take on d6. And now notice that white can actually win a pawn here with king rook takes pawn. But after king e7... Rook moves somewhere, I don't know, say d2, bishop e6. If you notice, white's pawns are very loose, particularly this guy and this guy. So black is actually better in this endgame, even though black is temporarily down a pawn. Um, and with same color bishops, black actually has some chances to win here. But it's important to know that idea of bishop g7, because it looks a little weird like to you know, sacrifice a pawn, but it turns out that um, by isolating these two pawns, black has more than ample compensation. I mean, black basically wins his pawn back by force at the very least, because it's going to take white some time to get this rook out. He's got to play moves like bishop e3, king e2, rook c1. And by that time, we're very doubled in this file, and we can simultaneously attack like a2 and, and c3. Okay, but that's not usually what black plays, or what white plays. Uh, white can also try moves like knight b3 or knight c2. They're kind of related. It's knight b3. The idea is that you play bishop g7, bishop e2, um, castle, bishop e3, and now either b6 or a5, and then you kind of try to exploit the fact that this knight is, you know, on, a, on an awkward square. Uh, the idea is that usually white at some point wants to play b3 to kind of shore up his pawns, and he'll never really get the chance. And then oftentimes this knight will come to d7 and, and to c5, and then this bishop will be opened up. Um, so for example, a5, and then with a4, just b6, and then the idea is to play <coughs> knight d7, knight c5, and to play bishop b7. And then you're putting pressure on the e4 pawn. So in the Roxy bind, uh, black's counterplay kind of stems from the fact that he can either attack this pawn on, on e4, attack this pawn on c4. So in this setup, knight d7, c5, and attack e4. And then the other way is if white plays knight c2. Now here you play bishop g7, bishop e2, castle, castle. And now either a6 or knight d7, either one. No, it's not. Because if white plays a4, then we're never going to really be playing b5. But we can start attacking e4. And if white has to play f3, then his pawns are all kind of 
um, stuck on light squares and his bishop on e2 becomes quite bad. And our knight on c5, now that white has played a4, means that our knight is perpetually on c5. Because white can never chase away with b4. So it's hard for white to make progress. Because usually white either makes progress with f4 or with b4. But with our pawn on a5, he can't play b4. And with our knight on c5, he can't play f4 because the e pawn is too weak. So black just gets good squares for his pieces. I mean, white does have a bit more space, but um, it's hard for white to actually make progress in those positions. So Meroxibine is kind of like uh, a trade-off between white trying to make progress and, and uh, making weaknesses in his position. Okay, so a, just a6, rook e1, and then rook b8, bishop d2, bishop b7, rook b1, and knight e8. The idea is b4, knight c7, and this knight's slowly coming around. So again, we're, we're fighting for the dark squares here. And then knight d4, and this should be roughly equal. The idea is this knight's coming around to c5 and pressuring a4 and e4 again. So oftentimes the, the white pawns will get a bit overextended and black will have some compensation in the form of weaknesses to, to attack in return for white's extra space advantage. So oftentimes when the knight on d4 moves away to c2, this knight on f6 will often move away as well to give this bishop additional scope. Um, okay, so that's, that's that. Okay, but by far the most common move is bishop e2. Uh, I guess we can take a look at f3 quickly. It, it kind of transposes knight d4, queen d4, bishop g7. This is what's going to happen against uh, bishop e2 as well, but... Uh, bishop e3, castle, queen d2, bishop e6, rook c1, queen a5, and I'm not really commenting these moves because you'll see this is basically what happens um, in the other lines, but uh, so for example, knight d5, queen a2, and this is a known pawn sack where you take on e7 and then it's pretty much theoretically equal, king h8, bishop e2, knight g8, knight d5, queen b2, queen b2, bishop e2, rook b1, and knight c7, rook b7, and then everything kind of gets traded, as you notice. So white's up a pawn here, but uh, the, the problem is, eventually, these bishops are going to get traded, and it's going to be good knight versus bad bishop, and really, white can never win this position, because this, this knight will be will far too strong. So the bishop will move somewhere. You know, you can play bishop d4 right away. Take, take, knight d4, put a pawn on e5. Uh, even trade rooks. I mean, just white can never win this. Okay. But, uh, yeah, a lot of exchanges. Okay. But let me show you guys the main line, which is bishop e2. Okay, and now the point of this move order is that on bishop e2, we want to play this move, knight takes d4. Similar to this f3 move, but uh, the point is we want to force this queen to move to d4. So in a lot of the main lines of the Roxy bind, uh, black gets, or white gets to play bishop e3, and then when we make this exchange, a white can recapture with a bishop. So by making this move immediately, the point is that this queen will eventually have to lose time moving from d4, because after we play bishop g7 and castle, this queen will feel a bit unsafe on d4. So it'll often either tuck back to e3 or, or d2. And so we kind of gain a tempo in a way over some of the main Roxy lines. Um, so yeah, this knight takes d4 move is important. And of course, notice the bishop e3 right away doesn't quite work because of what I showed before with knight g4 right away, which is why you play this move knight f6 and d6 first before anything else. So it makes sense, like you would think that if you play g6 on move 4, that one of your next couple of moves would be bishop g7. But you play specifically knight f6 and d6 so that you have this knight g4 option available in case of bishop e3. Because then the bishop is on g4 and the knight is ready to hop to g4. So move order is important in this one. But okay, so knight d4, queen d4, bishop g7. Okay, so this is all natural. And now black has, or white has three moves he can choose from. He can either play bishop g5, bishop e3, or castle. Uh, if white moves the bishop first, uh, this queen will often head back to d2. So I'll just show you guys. It's bishop g5, castle, and then queen d2. Queen e3 is less common, but also playable. After queen e3, the idea is you want to play bishop e6 and queen b6. 
And the point is these doubled whoops, these doubled pawns are actually not a problem because black gets good pressure on the A file and also the C file. And it's, and it's not easy for black to attack this pawn because white, or sorry, it's not easy for white to attack this pawn because black can always go knight d7, knight c5. So, you know, if white tries to take and play bishop e3 or something, black can always go knight d7, knight c5. And so that's an important point to remember, but, um, but queen d2 is more common. And now basically the idea here is that white, or sorry, that black, I don't know why I keep confusing black and white, but uh, black wants to try to play b5. It looks weird, right? Because white has three attackers on b5, knight, pawn, and bishop, and black has not a single piece on it. But as you'll start to see, um, all of black's moves are kind of aimed towards playing this move b5. Because it's really one of the only freeing advances that uh, black has against the Moroxy bind. Or else black is kind of suffocated by white's pawns. So, <clears throat> bishop e6, hit c4. Okay, now usually castle, but okay, even rook c1. Okay, queen a5. So the idea of queen a5 is that we actually want to use this rook to move to c8 rather than this rook. Because this rook sometimes wants to go to b8 to help support b5. So that's why we develop our queen first. So queen a5, castle, a6, again preparing b5, b3, rook fc8, again preparing b5. And now, for example, if f4... Well, actually, let's say, what about rook f e1? Well, wait, what about bishop f3? Yeah, okay, so bishop f3, rook a b8, rook e1, king f8. The point is to defend this pawn so that we can move this knight. Because b5 doesn't quite work yet because of these knight d5 ideas. But here, uh, black should be fine. Because one idea, black has to play knight d7, knight d5. Another one is knight d7, knight c5. And in some instances, this move b5 can actually uh, work. But, okay. So king f8 is a, a useful move in, in this particular line. Um, so, for example, f4. Okay, so here, rook c5. And there's actually an exchange check here, I think. Um, bishop d3. Yeah, so there's like a rook takes g5 here. <clears throat> and the point is that you sacrifice the exchange, but you get tremendous control of the dark squares. So, for example, rook g5, uh, fg5, and then I think knight g4 here. So the point is you're threatening like bishop d4 to e3. But also, if you can just plant an eye on e5, it's actually hard for white to make progress now because his kingside play is kind of um, gone. And black has really good control of the dark squares. Like bishop d4 is coming, queen e5 is coming, all sorts of stuff. Uh, also, this queen is hitting g5, maybe. Um, but it's, it's a little speculative. It's a little speculative. But okay, I mean, it's going a bit far afield. I just kind of want to show you guys the main ideas. Uh, okay, so if bishop e3, it's similar, it's similar to bishop g5. So uh, castle, queen d2, bishop e6, castle. So again, you're basically going to be playing bishop g7, castle, bishop e6, queen a5, rook fc8, a6, and then depending on what setup they use, often b5 will come. So I think here b5 is going to happen. So rook ac1, so a6, uh, let's say f3, rook fc8, b3, and here b5. And so the point is that even though it looks like that this pawn's attacked three times and only defended twice, there's actually tactics that actually hold this pawn. So for example, if cb5, ab5, notice that knight takes b5 doesn't work because at the very least this a2 pawn is gonna hang. And if bishop takes b5, then we can take on c3 first and then take on b5 and get two pieces for a rook. Both of which should be very good. So white would have to play something like rook c2 but then rook takes c3 is a nice exchange sacrifice, again. And then queen c3, queen c3, rook c3, and the point is rook a2, bishop b5, knight g4, etc. 
exploiting the fact that the rook and the bishop are attacked. And if the rook plays to d3, we can simply take on e3 and then play bishop d4 and win the exchange back. But of course we take on b3 first, so we just be up a clear pawn. So just to show you what I mean, if rook e3, knight e3, rook e3, bishop d4, so the only way to defend this is to play rook e1, but now just bishop takes b3. Followed by bishop takes e3. Should be quite good for black. So best would be to play fg4, but just bishop c3 and black is better. Because white's pawns are messed up, black's rook's on the 7th rank, and this pawn on b3 is weak. So that's a nice little trick. These rook takes c3s are commonplace in the Sicilian. Um, I'm just going to show you guys one more line. So if a3. So now this b5 doesn't work as well because white can play b4 to kind of meet it at the pass. But in, on a3, just knight d7. And then again, this knight's either coming to c5 or e5. Uh, this queen is probably going to come back to c7 and then pressure on on uh, c4. And notice that by playing this move a3, it makes this move b3 less palatable because it's, it's weak in this square. So if the pawn's on a2, a2, b3, c4 is kind of a strong pawn chain. But a3, b3, c4, not so much because a3 is weak and b3 is weak at both. So for example, a knight on c5 kind of hits b3. And so for, it kind of forces black or white to defend that. So when, when white weakens himself by playing a3, then you kind of want to take advantage of it by maneuvering the knight to b3. Uh, okay. I guess I'll show you guys one more thing. So castle, castle. And here, say queen e3 again. Um, so here, bishop d7, bishop d2, a6, queen d8. And a5. So a4. So here again, queen b8, the idea was to play b5. a4 stops it. And so once b5 has been stopped, we kind of need to make sure that white doesn't get too much of an initiative on the queen side. So we play this move a5. And then after rook a c1, bishop c6 to hit e4. b3, knight d7, again coming around to c5 because b3 is weakened. Knight d7, knight d5. Okay, so now he's starting knight takes e7, so we take take and knight c5 and this should be equal because we have a weak point on e7 but white has a weak point on b3 and notice that this bishop isn't really doing white any favors so this position should be roughly level this knight on c5 is very strong can't really be chased away okay so that's kind of the system that I play so basically, if white makes normal moves, you take on d4, you play bishop g7, you play bishop e6, you castle, you play queen a5, you play rook fc8, a6, and then b5. With with some little tricks involved, but the, the whole idea is to kind of play for b5. Um, and if white kind of does something proactive to stop it, then they're usually weakening themselves on the queen side a bit, and that knight on f6 can kind of hop around to take advantage of that. Okay, so any questions about that way to play? It's kind of straightforward and it's kind of systematic, so it's not too difficult to learn, but the positions can get tricky, like, because there are often end games that occur that are just kind of slightly worse for you. So, kind of simpler way to play is this move order. Okay, so c4. Now, instead of knight f6 first, we play bishop g7. This is kind of the more standard move order. And then bishop b3, knight f6. Okay, and, and here again, f3 is a mistake because of queen d6. Threatening knight takes e4. So if knight f5, queen takes b2, knight takes g7, king f8. And this is very good for black because this rook is hanging, this knight's hanging. Uh, okay. But 
obviously f3 is not the main move, the main move is knight c3. Okay, so let me just move this up. Okay, so now black can use a little trick here to exchange pieces. And black wants to exchange pieces because he's a bit behind in development and has a little bit less space. So the trick that black can use is to play this move knight g4. So the point is that this queen is defending this d4 knight. So if queen takes g4, we can simply take on d4. And that way we, we exchange pieces. Um, so knight takes c6 again, it doesn't work because of knight takes c3, knight takes d8, knight takes d1. Um, knight takes d1, king takes d8. Rook c1, b6, bishop d3, bishop b7, and black's doing quite well here. Two bishops, and these bishops are actually useful. And the fact that black can't castle doesn't affect him at all. This bishop on g7 is a, a monster. So th this is not something white should go in for. But the main move is to simply take on g4. Okay, so let me move that up. And then uh, black needs to capture this knight. So how do you guys think he should capture the knight? With the knight or with the bishop? So you can actually capture both ways, but one is definitely more standard than the other. So yeah, you want to take with the knight. Because it's not clear that we actually want to exchange bishops here, because our king side could get a little loose. Yeah, so knight takes is definitely the preference. And here, white usually plays the move queen to d1, which is interesting. I mean, this queen is actually not well placed on g4 because there are tactics involving d6 and d5 hitting the queen. And so the queen, in order to kind of gain a tempo, has to lose a tempo. So by playing queen d1, it attacks the knight, which makes sense. And really, there's no other good score for the queen because knight c2 is an issue. Uh, just for example, if castle... It's a little too early to kind of commit the king this way because after knight c6, uh, black can actually threaten bishop takes c3 here, ruining white's pawn shield around his king with ideas of queen a5 to follow. Or in this position, white or black can actually play e5. And then after, for example, h4, d5, again, exploiting this discovery. Queen g3, d e4, h5, and bishop f5. And black's doing well here. Um, okay, but usually queen d1 is played. And now black has a couple of choices. He can either defend this knight with e5 or move it back. Uh, the traditional square to move it back to is actually e6 not c6. c6 is a little too passive. With e6, the knight is potentially heading for d for c5 after a, a, an eventual d6, and then from c5 it can hit e4. Whereas on c6, it's not really as well posted because it's easier for white to defend c4 than it is for white to defend e4. So knight e6 is usually the most natural move. So after knight e6, white usually just continues his normal development with either rook c1 or queen d2. Um, part of the reason why white plays either rook c1 or queen d2 is that bishop takes c3 is kind of a quasi-threat. So for example, after bishop e2, we can actually take here. And we're not too worried about getting rid of our bishop because white's pawns are so terrible. So queen a5.
castle, queen takes c3, c5, queen e5. Queen a4 and castle. And black should be doing okay here. Because this knight can come to f4. And then d6 is coming. And then our pieces are getting out. And we're just up a pawn. So, like I said, black or white usually plays either queen d2 or c1. So if black plays queen e2 first, um, this can sometimes allow black to play queen a5, followed by this idea of knight c or d6, knight c5, bishop d7, and knight a4, which kind of exploits the pin. So I think rook c1 is actually slightly more accurate, but it's it's similar. And here black can choose between either uh, b6, queen a5, or d6. I think d6 is the most normal though. So after d6, uh, b4 probably, and then castle bishop e2, and a5. So we're just fighting for control of the c5 square. And here, black is probably doing okay too. Maybe slightly worse. But this bishop has a nice diagonal. And at some point, you know, if white plays f4, black can maybe counter with f5. And then, you know, play like big b6 and bishop b7 and try to attack the e-pawn like that. Um, so that's kind of how it goes with the knight g4 line. Um, I guess I can show you guys b6 as an alternative to d6. So if b6 first, well actually let's look at queen a5 instead of b6. Because it makes sense to get the queen out first, I think. So queen a5, queen d2, because we're actually threatening to take on c3 and take on a2 here. So queen d2 kind of stops that, because he can take back with a pawn if he wants. So now b6 I think is okay. And then bishop e2, bishop e7, f3. And here h5 is a good move to stop these bishop h6 ideas. And then castle g5. And notice that this queen defends this pawn from afar. Rook fd1. D6, knight d5, queen d2, rook d2, and bishop e5. And you know, black's fighting for control of squares here. Black's fighting for control of f4. You know, this knight on d5 is well posted, but it doesn't really do anything. This knight on e6 is controlling c7. We're playing rook c8, f6, king d7 as our next move. And black should be doing okay here. So that's a, that's a nice alternative to um, d6 right away. Because this queen on a5 is important to help control the dark squares so that we can play g5 and, and help control f4. So that's the knight g4 system. Another less common system against the Roxy. Um, is the b6 system. So there we're just trying to finchetto our bishop on c8 to attack e4. So again, bishop g7, bishop e3, knight f6, knight c3, and castle. Now bishop e2 to stop knight g4 ideas. 
preparing a castle. Okay, so now this move b6. So the main line of the Roxy is d6, and I'll get to that next time. Um, but this is an interesting sideline to try as well. So after castle, black plays bishop b7. And now the move that makes the most sense is to kind of shore up this pawn with f3. And then after f3, black can play a whole bunch of stuff. But probably the most logical move is to play knight takes d4. So after knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, d6, queen d2, knight d7, take, take, f4, a5. So a5 trying to control the c5 square for the knight. And put pressure on e4. And black's going to play moves like rook, rook c8, queen c7. And I'll show you guys one more possibility other than knight takes d4, though, <clears throat> which is potentially knight h5. So again, trying to fight for dark squares by putting the knight on f4 through tactical means. So knight takes c6, b takes c6. And white tried c5 here to block in this bishop, or else black was going to play c5 himself and create good prospects for his bishop. Um, so for example, if f4, then queen d1, rook a d1, bishop c3, b c3, c5. Notice that he's not worried about bishop takes h5 because this pawn would be weak and the doubled pawns don't really mean much. So instead, bishop to f3, knight f6 pressuring the pawn again, e5, bishop f3, g f3, back to h5, rook d7, rook fd8. And this is probably close to a draw because this bishop is not really doing much other than defending this pawn. And if what white wants to win a pawn, then black can infiltrate with his rook onto the 6th rank. And if rook fd1, I can just take on d7, play king f8, king e8, then rook d8, and again get my rook really active. So black should be doing okay here. Um, so c5 again, instead of f4, b5 f4, b4, knight a4, knight f6 hitting this pawn, bishop f3, bishop a6, freeing the bishop from its chain on c6, rook f2 and bishop e5, and this seems to be okay for, for black actually, because this knight is kind of stuck. And we have ideas of maybe playing queen a5, rook fd8 getting pressure on the d-file. White's pieces seem a bit uncoordinated. And this bishop, if this knight ever moves, becomes a monster. Attacking b2. So it's another way to play for black. If you want to try to take your opponent out of some Maroxy buying theory, it's a good way to go. Um, so yeah, so this about covers it for the Maroxy Bind sideline. Uh, episode 
four and the opening form will be dedicated to the main lines, which is when you play bishop g7, knight f6, <clears throat> uh, castle, and here you play d6. Uh, 